I will particularly uh, focus on the groups of disorders which are not uh, linked to mutations in factor eight and factor nine genes. Um, I was uh, assigned the title genome-wide analysis in the diagnosis of rare bleeding disorders, but I thought that we should have taken a much snappier and shorter one. And uh, I wanted to share with you uh, the first results of the 100,000 Genomes Project, which is a UK-wide project which aims to transform the genomic services in the National Health Service. I think the journey of genomics has started a long time ago, um, and particularly the genome sequencing project when I arrived in 1990 in Cambridge, there were two little sequencing machines, but eventually uh, the Cambridge team at the Sanger Institute contributed to a third of the deciphering of the human genome. That set us up well to continue to lead these developments, and in 2007, we were the first to report on a genome-wide association study in 14,000 patients with common diseases. And then from 2005, 6 on to very recent, actually, we, uh, particularly Nicole Sorenzo from the Sanger Institute, led uh, genome-wide association meta-analysis studies across the world, bringing data together on hundreds of thousands of individuals where we had genotype and phenotype. I think this is now going to be superseded in the UK by the green segment, the UK Biobank Initiative, half a million people who will be whole genome sequenced, and a two cohorts that I have helped to develop of compare an interval of 80,000 blood donors. Here, we have genotype linked to health service records, and that will help us to determine in the next five years which variants are tolerated uh, and do not cause severe disease. However, I go to focus on the yellow section. The yellow section is about rare diseases. Uh, I want to make clear that the reason why we have been able to pioneer this area, it started with the DDD project led by the Sanger Institute, deciphering developmental disorders where 14,000 children and the father and mother were sequenced, followed by the project from Nicole Sorenzo, UK 10K project, where 10,000 people, their whole genome was sequenced. And now, that's in 2012, led to a decision uh, to sequence 100,000 DNA samples from NHS patients, not as part of research, but part of service innovation to change the landscape of genetic testing in the NHS, in every hospital in the country, for every patient that needs these tests. There are many, many rare diseases. Estimates are 7,500. You see here rolling in a script in three different colors, the rare diseases of the blood, the thrombosis and hemostasis system, and the immune system. You see a history of doctors or scientists wanting to link their name to a rare disease, creating a chaos of nomenclature, double-named conditions like Berna and Suye, there were two different doctors, syndrome. I see this disappearing where we go to an era where mutations in a gene will be associated with an expected set of phenotypes to present during life. What the 100,000 Genomes Project set out is to make the NHS ready to close this immense odyssey of 2.2 years where father and mother wait on a conclusive molecular diagnosis. And where historically, obviously, this is not the case for hemophilia, but where parents got only a conclusive diagnosis in two out of 10 cases. The reason why this all became possible is because of the invention of next generation sequencing led by Shankar in Cambridge, where he developed chemistry that has been passed on to Illumina, but allowed the sequencing of a genome to become affordable. This led to a first genome, thousand genome sequence and thousand genomes project, genome-wide sequencing, UK 10K, now the 100,000, but may I point out that other initiatives and I've not put the American initiatives on this European slide, with 235,000 genomes going to be sequenced in France, and in the UK, as I mentioned, the 500,000 genomes from the UK Biobank, and the 50,000 genomes from the Interval study. 
AstraZeneca has announced that no patients that participate in clinical trials will uh, be not offered the opportunity to get their genome sequenced, as they see it as a way to improve the chances of getting more drugs through regulatory approval. I have been asked in 2012 to lead the pilot phase of the 100,000 Genomes Project. You show here what we have achieved in the past years. We've connected in England with 50 hospitals globally, with 74 hospitals. We have trained 360 clinical care teams in how to consent patients for whole genome sequencing. Imagine every clinical care team having five people that were 1,800 people trained, 13,000 patients and their close relatives connected, whole genome sequencing in an accredited laboratory, a single laboratory for the whole island for 55 million population. We really don't need a second laboratory. Why would you? And we did clinical feedback of pertinent findings and there where we had no explanation for the cause of disease, we proceeded with research. In these panels here, you see at the top in the A panel a heat map where in the vertical columns you have the different projects. May I pick out PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension, devastating rare disease that sets in the fourth to fifth decade of life. The second column, BPD, bleeding, platelet, and thrombotic disorders. What I want to illustrate here that if you code these patients with HPO terms, to which I'll come back later, that you see that a mutated gene often plays out its pathological game in multiple tissues. At the right, you see how good and committed the clinical care teams have been to coding in HPO terms. You see in these little graphs for each of the diseases the number of terms assigned per patient and the distribution of those number of terms. We needed to educate people about what it means to sequence a genome of father, mother, and the children. Here, Liz has a disorder which is caused by a mutation that has been passed on from the mum and a mutation that passed on from the dad. Can we, may I remind you that we have sequenced 3.2 billion bases in the mother and 3.2 billion bases in the father. And in the three children, in this hypothetical case, you have 25 mobile phones of data. It's almost as many mobile phones as in this room. And that means that you need powerful new statistical methods which we have developed and applied and new compute solutions to quickly analyze this immense amount of data to make a file that can be managed within the NHS firewall and could be mounted if the children would agree on the telephone from mum or dad or both. If you have a genome, you can see a lot. Here you see, using the 1000 Genomes Project principal component analysis for ethnicity mapping, that you can map every person's sequence with great accuracy to the ethnicity cluster from which it came. And this shows we did checking of self-declared ethnicity versus genetic ethnicity, and no surprise to you, there were a substantial number of errors in the self-declared ethnicity. We also can compute out the relatedness scores. And here in these horizontal bars, you see for the different rare disease domains that the principal investigators have taken a different approach. Some have brought in large pedigrees with up to 15 members, and these pedigrees were rebuilt. We connected families in different parts of the country that were not apparently connected. These are sensitive issues which need to be managed with great care, certainly if children of both families have the same severe pathology. The 13,000 genomes were reviewed for, pet for variants after filtering whether they were pathogenic or clearly pathogenic, likely pathogenic, or in green, variants of unknown significance. We adhered to the American guidelines, and we did not report, and there we differ, on the first, except if the multidisciplinary team that refused those results decided that that particular variant of unknown significance was worth reporting because further studies had to be undertaken on that variant in pedigree studies. 
okay, is this doing any good for diagnosis? Have we improved over the past four years? May I take retinal dystrophy, a single center study of more fields with 728 patients enrolled with premature blindness. The diagnostic sensitivity on that was 15% when we started, and in three years we have moved that to 55% by only looking at the coding space of the genome. Neurodevelopmental children who have on their developmental milestones, serious setbacks, 661 cases. We have there not as a dramatic improvement, but this is a very wide area of pathology, and we have one in five children get a conclusive diagnosis. I now take you to a number of projects where there was pre-screening. Clinicians were asked to not enroll hemophilia A cases or hemophilia B cases or a patient with Glenzmann's thrombostenia or our colleagues in pulmonary arterial and hypertension with said from, if you know the patient has a mutation BMPR2, what's the main gene for PAH, then don't enroll, because we want to use these projects for gene discovery. And you see, therefore, a much lower diagnostic sensitivity, as expected, and a complement us to all our colleagues who have used common sense to not enroll patients with mutations in known genes. There's an exception to this in the stem cell myeloid project was co coordinated from the University of Oxford by Irene Roberts, where you had 72 trios of children, father and mother, where the child generally presented with a severe premature anemia, and we felt that, Irene felt that trio sequencing might lead to a higher diagnostic rate, and I think she has proven that very well. And this informed the decision by the main program to push very hard in early pathology to sequence the three samples of father, mother, and child. I now want to take you to the domain where you may be a bit more comfortable of the bleeding, platelet, and thrombotic disorders. This was an international collaboration bringing centers across the world together to share phenotype data and genotype data, where the genotyping was done in a single center. So if you really believe there will be many different sequencing centers in the future, I think you may be a bit blind for the developments to come. In this domain, may I look, walk you through the numbers? So in total, we have sequenced 15,000 patients, of which 13,000 got their whole genome sequenced. 1,200 patients were in that group of bleeding and platelet disorders. They were allowed into that cohort if they had abnormal platelet function, if they had unexplained bleeding, if the cause was an no, unknown, and a common sense clinical assessment by a specialist in the hemophilia center or other specialized center would say it was likely to be genetic. At the other side, we did a gene panel test. Kate Down spoke about this yesterday. It's a gene panel test with 96 genes approved by ISTH as being genes that are linked to platelet bleeding and thrombotic disorders, and we sequenced in total 2,000 or now 3,000 patients on that particular panel. Just a short about human phenotype ontology. This is difficult for us as professionals. We've been trained to assign diagnoses. And here we ask you to step back and tell us, the computer, what the patient is telling you in terms and then translate that in a compute number. And these different compute numbers are linked to each other in an ontological structure, making them much more powerful for compute analysis and gene discovery. Here you see the enrollment criteria in horizontal rows for the bleeding platelet and thrombotic project. And in the heat map shows whether a particular term is used, but I want to draw to your attention that roughly 10% of cases have nerve, neuronal HPO terms switched on, generally autism, migraine, depression, linked to platelet disorders. That immune disorders are linked to platelet disorders is not so surprising, but a much higher level of skeletal disorders with patients with platelet disorders than was assumed in the textbooks of medicine. May I illustrate this with a case of large platelets, maybe a bit boring, not that many of them. Platelet mass is generally pretty well fixed, so if they get bigger, you get lower platelet numbers in most rare diseases of platelet formation. But this fam there were two families in different countries that had 
hearing loss and macrotomosarpenia, and statistically did, did, did drive automatically a gene discovery which showed that when these different terms were used to cluster these two families, that the mutation in the gene called DIAF1 was underlying this new disorder, and there are now seven families reported in the world. Taking one of the 10 domains in the pilot disease for the 100,000 Genomes Project, the BPD project on bleeding and platelet disorders, has identified 24 new genes since 2013. Many are published already, as you can see at the bottom, and others are currently in the publication pipeline. We also had a number of genes that we statistically did not see, but when other groups reported on them, like CYCS, which was reported by a group in New Zealand, we have massive replication of these gene discoveries by others in our cohort, except for one gene, which you just have to wonder whether that gene discovery is extremely rare or whether it was an erroneous discovery. I want to share with you a bit about the pathogenic variant identification. First, all these data are put in a single database for the country very important for 55 million population. We will share these data with ClinFAR and ClinGen in America so that it can be globally used. So no data hiding, data sharing across the globe. At the left side, you see the sequencing of the 13,000 whole genomes and 1,213 patients with bleeding disorders and platelet disorders. At the right side, you see this panel test and the results. We have pathogenic variants in the whole genome sequencing of 13%. And if you submit a sample for sequencing on the thrombogenomics gene panel test, one in two patients get conclusive molecular diagnosis. So far, in this one domain, we have helped 808 probands and their relatives. And it's important to realize, once you have identified the problem, particularly if you're talking about dominant diseases, that there is this obligation on us to do cascade testing in the family. The mutations are spread across a large number of genes that are illustrated here with every segment of green giving you the, estimate, the relative number of cases. And at the left, you see the different categories of platelet disorders, thrombotic disorders, and coagulation disorders in this group of nearly 1,000 patients. May I lift out and discuss with you in some greater detail why it is important to get a conclusive molecular diagnosis? Because it informs treatment. If you're in an unlucky scenario to have mutations in genes that regulate transcription in megakaryocytes and early hematopoietic stem cells, some of those have such an increased risk of hematological cancers that the discussion with the parents of the allotransplant should be had. And if not, I think you are missing your obligations to deliver good medical care. If you have the mutations in genes that, that play the game of, of platelet birthing, so the actin polymerization uh, regulation, where we have 133 patients with mutations in actin-1. So far, we think it was a discovery from Japan that the actin-1 mutations that give you macrotromosarpenia are totally benign, and it helps the management. But we have seen many patients with actin-1 mutations who had first, second, and third-line treatment for ITP. Secondly, if you have mutations in MyH9, WES, and DIAF, either your kidneys start becoming insufficient, with progress of age, you become deaf, or with viscot aldrich, you have an increased risk of malignancy. I want to focus a bit and illustrate this on the granule disorders. I think genetically, the granule disorders are difficult to track, but we have made some inroads there. And I want to particularly take you in the story of the mutations in the MBL2 gene, which was reported as the responsible gene for gray platelet syndrome in uh, 2011 by three groups. We think there are around, at the moment, 80 reported cases, and I go to share with you some information about 40 of these cases. It's so autosomal recessive disorder that's described in the NIH, NIH rare disease catalog as a mild bleeding disorder. 
which is copied across to the European database that says the same. And that's it. And that's wrong. So let's look what is the case with people who lack alpha granules from their platelets. First, the mutational pattern. You see here 79 GPS causing variants by taking that what's reported in the literature and the 35 new variants that have been identified on the thrombogenomics gene test. The mix of variants that we see are typical missense frame shift nonsense and splice and deletions and insertions. What's important that we saw this enrichment of variants in this unique domain of MBL2, the beach domain, which prompted us to do some further work on that particular domain that has no function assigned. But may I first take you into the other clinical presentations. Here you see that half the patients have bleeding symptoms. And there where a bone marrow biopsy is done, we have 10 patients have myelofibrosis and four have not, but that are generally the younger patients. In 24 patients, no bone marrow has been done because there was no clinical indication and it would not be ethical to do it in someone with a bleeding disorder. At the right, you see that bleeding can be in different organ systems. It can be life-threatening, or patients have died of bleeding unexpected after dental extraction. This had been mentioned in case reports that in some of these patients with gray platelet syndrome, there was autoimmunity. And here you, I show that in 18 patients, patients out of this cohort of nearly 40, 40 patients, there is severe autoimmunity that segregates with the ambient 2 mutations. And I've quoted myself many of the patients in Paris, and I can tell you there is not one file on the table. There is per patient generally five large paper files on the table describing their pathologies through their life. So this is not a gentle disorder. And if it was my child, I was wondering, I would be wondering whether it should be transplanted. To understand the pathology better, we went into the mouse system. We created a knockout mouse, it was a bit boring because it had the same phenotype as humans, a big spleen. And uh, we made, a, by chance, observation that there was no metastasis of uh, lung cancer in the mouse model. And that can be explained by the platelets being dragging the lung cancer cells around the body. And I think. Having that mouse system allows us to explore some further questions. And we went back to the human system to ask what is this beach domain where most of the mutations are sitting? Where is it interacting with? And one of the PhD fellows discovered that it interacts with DOC7, with a guanine exchange factor, and that directly explains why you have macrothrombocytopenia. And it explains most likely also part of the immune phenotype. So I say, I've told you a story about a platelet granule disorder, gray platelet syndrome, a much more complex syndrome than we together thought. And this is explained because, as you see in this cartoon, where at the top you see the expression level of the different beach domain genes in the different blood cell types in horizontal rows and in neurons, that depending where the mutations sit, like an MBL2, then you have not only alpha granules are absent from your platelets, but specific granules are absent from your neutrophils. If you have mutations in MB, then dense granules are abnormal formed in platelets, but in other type of granules in your neuronal cells are abnormal formed, hence you have severe autism. If you have mutation in LRBA, you don't go to see the hematologist or you don't go to the hemophilia center, but you present yourself to the immunologist with an immune disorder. So I think we have a set of granule pathologies unfolding in front of us, where, as we know from hermansky putlak syndrome, that there is a much more complex pathology than maybe the textbooks would suggest. I've told you a story how genome medicine is going to change the way we deliver healthcare. I have told you a story about that sequencing is boring and should be done in factories where there are no lab staff but many machines. I've told you a story of statisticians working with bioinformaticians, working with computer scientists across the globe. 
280 people have access to our high-performance computer, and I was just talking with the, our next speaker, who is essential leader in the TopMed program in the States, where the same philosophy is applied. I would never be able to explain to one patient that the data are not shared because that would benefit my laboratory, but would not benefit patients at all. I think there's an obligation on this society to lead in data sharing. You are running behind, sorry to say so, but the cancer community is showing that data sharing across the world is really needed to bring benefit to patient care. At the left, you see how we did diagnosis for patients the last decades. At the right, you see how the single, simple taking of a DNA sample followed by next generation sequencing with a whole genome done for $200 by 2025 will completely change the landscape by which we reach molecular diagnosis for patients and inform the treatment that these patients deserve. Thank you very much.